All right, so we are going to look at the immune system diseases and disorders in this lecture video. My other mic is out, so you get me with my gaming headset um, or my vo voiceover headset that I normally use. But at least we don't have all the static that we have when I've tried to record these several times already. So we're going to dive in and we're going to do a quick review of the lymphatic system first. We talk about the anatomy. Um, the anatomy of the lymphatic system, when we're looking at this, the organs that are present are the thymus gland and the bone marrow. Those two are considered the primary organs of the lymphatic system. And the reason they're called the primary organs is because they're the ones responsible for actually producing the B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So when we talk about the lymphatic system and those lymphocytes that are produced, they're the main areas that this happens. When we look at the lymph nodes, the spleen, the liver, and the tonsils, these are like secondary sets of organs. They are still very important for the lymphatic or immune system. What they're going to do is they're going to help capture, filter, help the immune system destroy invaders. So they're not the ones that actually do the the attacking or the destroying of the foreign invader, but they do help with capturing it and holding it um, for the B cells and T cells to get there to fight. All right, so let's look a little bit at the physiology. We talked about this in the previous lecture, but guys, our immune response, we have a specific immune response and a non-specific immune response. The non-specific immune response is the one you're born with. This is also known as your innate immunity. This is like inflammation, your skin with your physical barriers, your mucous membranes, um, any chemicals that are produced like the acids and the oils of your skin, your stomach acid, your tears, your saliva, your urine, all that kind of stuff is going to be some of those chemical barriers. And these are known as more of your first and second line of defense. Another thing that we do see with inflammation, and we talked about it last video, was the phagocytosis and how the neutrophils come in and actually will help neutralize the invader by doing phagocytosis like Pac-Man, eating up the invader and destroying it on the inside. On the specific immunity, this is kind of the last line or third line of defense. This is the one that's adaptive. It's the one that changes over time. Um, this one is gonna rely on your body recognizing the antigens that are on the invader, realizing they don't belong, and then they're going to try to figure out who is invading, like what is this invader? Then they're gonna come up with a plan on how to fight that invader, and that includes making antibodies. So this creates an antigen antibody type reaction to take place that is very specific to that one invader. Also in this process, when we talk about the specific immunity, this is gonna be the one that makes the memory cells, and so that the next time you're exposed to that specific invader, you already have a defense to fight it. So guys, if we take a look, here's just a little kind of flow chart. It shows your immunity. The innate immunity is what we're all born with. That is gonna be the things like inflammation, skin, mucous membranes, chemicals. The adaptive immunity is the one that's acquired over time, which means yours is different than mine. When we look at the acquired immunity though, there are two branches to it. There's the cell mediated branch. These are the T lymphocytes. They're gonna do more hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then we also have the antibody mediated known as the humoral response. That's going to be the B lymphocytes and they are responsible for making antibodies. Now guys, in reality, there should also be kind of like a, a line to go between these two because they also are going to work together specifically to be successful. They have to be in communication. If they're not in communication, the immune system cannot work properly. So guys, here are the like key players when we talk about the immune response with the immune system cells, we see that we have the leukocytes that are the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Um, when we look at these guys, these are going to have particular granules inside of their cells. And so those granules are gonna contain chemicals and things to help neutralize the invader or at least to call for help. Neutrophils are able to do phagocytosis. Eosinophils are normally pretty big in allergic type reactions. And basophils, they actually release histamine, which is gonna call in reinforcements. We then we see the monocytes. The monocytes, remember, become macrophages when they get into the actual tissues. They are going to do phagocytosis as well, but they are like the bigger tanks. 
We then see the lymphocytes. Now the lymphocytes are gonna be the ones that are part of the specific immunity. You have the T lymphocytes and they're part of that cell mediated immunity. They're going to be things like the natural killer cells and T cytotoxic cells, um, more hand-to-hand -hand combat. The B lymphocytes are the humoral immunity and they are gonna be the ones that create antibodies. Now they do this by doing mitosis, creating kind of clones of themselves. Those clones are called plasma cells and the plasma cells are responsible for produce, producing the actual antibodies. Now, there are several types of immunity that we need to discuss. Um, when we look at this, active is going to be in two of them, passive are in the other two, and then you're going to see natural and artificial. So let's break down what these mean. We first see that you can have active natural immunity. Now, active natural immunity means that you've actually had the disease. You caught the disease, your immune system then actively made a response against that disease, and now you have that protection. All right, so I got chickenpox in elementary school. I fought that chickenpox. I now have the antibodies against chickenpox, and I haven't gotten it again. So that's active natural immunity. You naturally were exposed to it, like normal. You actively fought it, okay? We then have active artificial immunity. Now this is still where your body's gonna actively fight and come up with a plan and make memory cells, but you received the exposure artificially. This is what we see with vaccines. Okay, so this is like the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR vaccine. This is where you receive the vaccine, your body recognized it as foreign, it created a response to help protect your body. So you still have the protection, but you received it artificially through a shot. We also see that we have passive natural immunity. Passive natural immunity is when antibodies are produced by the body itself or received from um, a maternal fetus transmission. So what happens here is, they're naturally made by someone's body, specifically a lot of times the mother, and these are passed to the baby across the placenta or through breastfeeding. Those are going to give the baby a sense of protection, but only for a short time because the baby's not actually making them. All right, and so this is kind of like a borrowed type of immunity, but it's a natural borrowed, okay? And so we see that happens with the crossing the placenta before childbirth, as well as breastfeeding. The last one here is passive artificial immunity, and this is where we actually inject the antibodies. So we're letting them borrow the antibodies, but we're going to inject them through a shot, and it's going to help them fight off the invader. But no memory cells are created here. In both types of passive immunity, no memory cells are made. So they do not end up making their own um, antibodies, therefore no memory cells. When we look at passive artificial, this is like what we would see with a type of Rogam shot is a good example. Women who are RH negative have had an RH positive baby and there's a mixing of the blood. We don't want her to make antibodies against another RH positive baby. So we give the antibodies to her through a shot, the Rogam shot. This shot helps her fight off the baby's blood because it's technically foreign because it has that positive marker on it, but it doesn't make it where she has antibodies or memory cells so that the next time she gets pregnant, if she has a positive baby, her body doesn't attack it. All right, so there's a number of different reasons why we would use this different type of immunity, but these are the four types. So here's just another chart showing you those types again. So we see the natural active is gonna be where antigens enter your body and naturally, the invader got in naturally. Your body induces the antibodies. Um, you're gonna create a response and you're going to have memory cells. Natural passive, again, antibodies pass from mother to fetus via the placenta or infants when they drink their mother's milk. They aren't actually making any of these antibodies, therefore there's no memory cells. In artificial active, antigens are introduced through a vaccine, through a shot. The body still actively produces a response. Therefore, there are memory cells. And then artificial passive is this where antibodies are going to be given in like an immune serum. They're injected in and they have the purpose of helping you fight that invader. But again, no memory cells are 
produced. So now when we're looking at issues or disorders of the immune system, we want to look for some common signs and symptoms. Okay, there's going to be some commonalities between some of these. Now in others, there's not going to be as many. So anytime we're going to be looking at these chapters that follow now that we're focusing in on certain organ systems, we're going to be looking at the different signs and symptoms. We're going to be looking at the different ways to diagnose these diseases, um, possible treatments. Okay, so there's a lot of things we're going to be looking at. But in some of these, there are some common signs and symptoms. Now, these vary depending on the organ involved. Depending on which organ is involved in the problem is going to give those types of symptoms. However, we do see that if it's an immunodeficient disorder, there's a lack of immunity that's happening. There's not enough immune response. If it's an autoimmune issue, your immune system is attacking yourself, which that shouldn't happen either. And then if it's what we call an isoimmune, this is where the immunity is against other humans. So this would be something like a tissue rejection, okay? Because you get a transplant or something, and so it's against that other tissue that didn't come from you. And so when we look at this, a lot of these, like when we look at autoimmune or isoimmune, those are going to be where it's like an over-exaggeration of your immune system, whereas immunodeficient is where it's not enough. Okay. Now when we talk about, so several types of diagnostic tests that can be done when we're looking at um, these different types of immuno issues are things like skin tests. Skin tests are going to be like allergy tests where they're going to go in and they're going to, in like a picture here, they're going to either uh, prick or scratch or do something with the actual antigen and see how your body responds. If there is a redness and inflammation that occurs um, that's over exaggerated, then you're more allergic to that than something else. This leads a lot of times to looking at desensitization where we can try to give some sort of treatments to help desensitize you towards those things. Again, diagnosing to see if it's getting better or worse. We can also do a blood count. A lot of times a total blood workup can help us look to see what the issue is, especially when we're looking at white blood cells. Different white blood cells will be in higher number based on what kind of infection is present. Some will be higher for bacterial infections, other for parasite infections, so it could give us an idea of what's happening. We also see that there's something called the Combs test. A uh, Combs test is used a lot of times when we're looking for antibodies on red blood cells, especially for maternal antibodies. All right, so they would do a Combs test. If you are early in your pregnancy, then they do blood work. A Combs test is gonna be done to double check to make sure that you don't have antibodies that would ultimately attack the baby. We also see anti-nuclear antibodies or ANAs. This is a test that's used to look for certain antibodies that are in indicators of lupus which is an autoimmune disorder. And then also rheumatoid factor or RF is another one we're looking for, particular antibodies that are present for rheumatoid arthritis. And again, that's another type of autoimmune disorder. So there's a number of different tests out there. These are just some of them, but it gives you an idea of some of the things we might utilize. So guys, if we look at all immune diseases, they can be broken up into kind of two broad groups. We have the immunodeficiency over here, and this is where your immune system does not react good enough. There's not a well enough response to it. It's an underreaction. This is going to be something like an immunodeficiency like AIDS. AIDS stands for acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. On the other side of this, we have the hypersensitivity. This is where your immune system overreacts to the antigen. All right. So it doesn't just react like normal. It's going to overreact. And there's some different categories with this. So we see allergies. This is normally due to an environmental or acquired antigen, things like hay fever, asthma, or poison ivy. There's there's also autoimmunity falls into this because the body should not attack itself and we find self antigens as part of this like rheumatic fever, systemic lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis. On the other hand, we also have the isoimmunity. This is a hypersensitivity to another's antigens. This is like a blood transfusion reaction or a tissue get graft rejection or that RH blood reje reaction we saw with the like mother to baby. So these are going to be where you're reacting to a tissue that came from somebody else that's been put into your body. All right, so we're going to talk about a number of these in each of the categories. These are not by any means all of the immune system disorders, but we do want to look at least at a few in each category. So we're going to look at the hypersensitivity disorders first, where your body or your immune system overreacts to what it's been exposed to. And when we look at these guys, remember, we're going to look at a description 
We're going to look at the etiology, like what causes it, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention on each of these. So allergies are the first one we're going to look at, and allergies are one of the most prevalent type of hypersensitivity that we see. Some examples of these are hay fever and asthma. It's um, some common reactions that we see occur with people who have allergies are Uticaria, which are hives, or also what we see contact dermatitis, where where you've come in contact with that allergen causes um, the skin to kind of break out and that sort of thing. So some other symptoms we see are elevated eosinophil count. Okay, so if we were to take blood work, we would see the eosinophils are going to be higher in number. We'll also see inflammation, things like redness, heat, swelling, and itching in the area. A runny nose, coughing, sneezing, wheezing, and nasal congestion are a big part of allergies because the respiratory system normally becomes involved. Now, when we look at allergies, a lot of times allergies are very bothersome, like they bother the individual, but they can also be very life-threatening in some cases. When we look at this, a lot of times if the, the respiratory system is involved, that's a type of airborne allergen that is the issue. We do see that there are kind of four types of hypersensitivities that fall in here. We have the type 1 hypersensitivity, which is like the hay fever and the asthma. Type 2 is a transfusion reaction, which we're going to talk more about later when we talk about blood transfusions. Type 3 is your um, autoimmune issues like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And then type 4 is like the contact dermatitis here. The type 4 is kind of a delayed. It doesn't happen necessarily right away. And again, and we'll hit on that in just a minute. So we're gonna look mostly at this type one real quick where we're gonna look at hay fever a little bit closer. So when we look at hay fever, hay fever is a reaction to an allergen in the mucous membranes of the nose and the upper respiratory tract. So some sort of allergen got into your nose or upper respiratory tract and it triggered this reaction. Symptoms include sneezing, watering eyes, a runny nose, and itching. The causes can be seasonal. When we look at seasonal allergies, this could be due to tree pollen. Trees don't produce pollen all year round, so we would see that seasonal. Certain grasses, ragweed pollen, those from weeds, and then agricultural crops. Those could all be what we consider seasonal type allergies. On the other hand, there are causes that are non-seasonal, things that are around all the time, and this includes dust mites, a pet dander, or even food allergies. Okay, and so when we're looking at this whole idea of hay fever or different allergies, treatment is removal of the allergen. A lot of times the main thing is to avoid what causes those allergies to be triggered. Okay, so avoidance or removal. Um, air conditioning, air conditioned environment, we do see that that can help with the filters that are present if we can filter out a lot of those allergens. Um, but another thing is you might need to move to a whole different climate. I know that's hard to think about, but sometimes it's the area that you live in that's triggering most of those allergies. You go somewhere else, you don't have near as many problems. We might also have the patient take antihistamines. If the allergies are bad enough and they're kind of those all year round allergies, they may need to do the allergy desensitization shots. This is to try to help desensitize them so they don't have that severe reaction. Another thing that we see that comes into play a lot of times too is if we're looking at a house setting, tile helps a lot because carpets and fabrics hold on to allergens and so tile could help. Um, we also see washing the bedding regularly and when we look at dusting with more of a wet or damp cloth versus a dry cloth. When you're using a dry cloth, it just knocks all those allergens just back into the air before they settle. And if you use that kind of damp cloth, it will be able to capture them better. So those are just some other things of just like everyday things that could be helpful with that treatment. All right, so now let's move on to asthma. When we look at asthma, asthma is also known as bronchial asthma because it's deeper into the lungs. Um, symptoms are going to be things like extreme shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, wheezing, anxiety, and coughing. Um, a lot of times because of them not being able to catch their breath, their anxiety goes up and then that kind of triggers a vicious cycle there. Um, we do see that this can be mild to also life threatening. This is still a type one hypersensitivity. Treatment is going to be avoidance of the causative allergens. If certain all allergens trigger your asthma, we want to stay away from that. Again, desensitization might be useful in some cases. Education's a big thing as well as certain medications. Now, some of these medications 
they're normally like a regime. They're going to be kind of a combination of things. It might be some breathing treatments. It may also be a type of inhaler. Another thing with education that comes along with this is also using relaxation techniques to help with anxiety and like calming the breathing as well as exercise. Exercise a lot of times makes your lungs in better shape to handle things like this. And so exercise is a big deal. Now there's no cure when we talk about asthma. Once you have it, you have it. Uh, but we can control it a lot of times, again, with exercise, avoidance, and certain medications. Now, euticaria is one of those things that happens when you have a pretty severe reaction to an allergen. This is hives or called a needle rash. This is a vascular reaction and it's manifesting itself on the skin. So this one has gone a little bit deeper. It's not just in like your upper respiratory tract. It's not just in your lower with, we talk about asthma. This one is more kind of systemic through the body. Now causes or contact to an external irritant, such as like certain insect bites, pollen, um, certain drugs, especially types of antibiotics can trigger this, certain foods and even certain plants. Symptoms include elevated red or pale lesions. These are known as wills or hives on the skin, and they are severely itchy. Now, treatment when we talk about euticaria or hives is antihistamines. Antihistamines are going to help with the itch and then, of course, avoidance of that allergy. So if it is a food, if it is a drug, if some of that stay away from it, don't consume that anymore. Now, the reason we need to be careful with this, especially if it's something you've ingested, there's a higher chance that when you're exposed subsequent times to an allergen, the um, allergic reaction will actually get worse. This could ultimately lead to something called anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a very severe allergic reaction to an allergen, and a lot of times it comes to being exposed multiple times. Now, again, causes of anaphylaxis we see tend to be things like antibiotic, anesthetics, codeine, insulin, certain vaccines, foods, pollens, and even latex. That's why a lot of times you'll see things that are latex-free now. Again, anaphylaxis or this allergic reaction may be mild, but when it gets life-threatening, this is going to lead us to a bigger issue. Itching of the throat, tongue, and scalp starts to happen at first. We start to see swelling or edema of the face. And the area that becomes the big issue is when airways start to close up. They start to swell shut, which causes difficulty in breathing. Anytime we have a patient or a person who has difficult breathing, they are the top of our priority list, okay? Because if they're not breathing, they're not alive. So we need to make sure that that airway gets opened back up. Now, treatment. If anaphylaxis is severe enough and the swelling is great enough, we may need to do an emergency trache tracheostomy. This is where they go in right below here. They'll cut and in the movies, you'll see that they'll cut with like a knife and then use a pin. It's the same kind of concept, but it is going through the trach, avoiding all of this area that has been inflamed and swollen. Epinephrine a lot of times will help. This puts your body in that fight or flight situation and that causes dilation of the respiratory system. Cor uh, cortico steroids could also be beneficial and antihistamines. All right, so these are different treatments we would see for anaphylaxis. Now the corticosteroids and the antihistamines are to help reduce the amount of histamine that's being released, which then helps deter or slow down the inflammation process, which is that swelling. Now guys, food allergies, food allergies could be things like chocolate or shellfish, but the list can go on and on. If you eat something you're allergic to, a lot of times at first it'll cause cramping, diarrhea, and vomiting. But it's very hard to diagnose food allergies because we have to remove all of the food from our diet. Okay. Like we have to get to like a liquid clear broth diet. And then we have to add things in slowly to see what you are actually allergic to. That creates a kind of problem. We see that it makes you want to, then you need to avoid certain foods. We do see the allergy tests can test for certain foods that are culprits a lot of times. Those include things like peanuts, especially, but that's going to be those food allergies. So the next one we have is the contact dermatitis, and this is actually a type four hypersensitivity. This can be acute or chronic allergic reaction that you see on the skin. 
Now, some common causes of this are things like cosmetics, laundry products, plants, jewelry, paint, and drugs. Um, when we talk about plants, a lot of times this is like poison oak or poison ivy. It gets on your skin. Oils of the plant get on your skin and you have a delayed reaction. You do not actually see the rash come up right away. It's normally like a couple hours after exposure. The same thing kind of happens when you change laundry products and you find you're allergic to it after you've been wearing those clothes a while, you start to see the irritation on your skin. All right. And so these are normally a little bit more delayed. Now, when we look at contact dermatitis, it can actually be very localized or it can cover the entire body depending on how the exposure has happened. One of the best ways of treatment for contact der dermatitis is avoidance. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders fall into the type three hypersensitivity. This is where the body fails to recognize self versus not self. So your immune system cells are kind of taught or trained. This is you, this is not you early on. And so when autoimmune disorders happen, this is where they almost like forget or they're not trained. And so they attack you instead of just attacking foreign invaders. All right. So you start attacking yourself. Um, one example of this when we look at is rheumatic fever. This follows a group A strep infection. So it first starts out as you actually have a strep infection and your body is fighting that like it should. But rheumatic fever occurs one to four weeks after the strep infection has pretty much been taken care of. Now this can be a sudden or gradual onset that occurs, but this is where antibodies begin to attack um, specifically the heart. These antibodies like to attack the heart valves and this results in heart failure. So rheumatic fever is a pretty severe thing. An accurate diagnosis of a strep infection is key with this and getting the proper treatments as soon as possible when we look at the autoimmune disorder here for rheumatic fever. Another type of autoimmune issue is rheumatoid arthritis. Now rheumatoid arthritis is where there's abnormal antibodies that are going to attack or attach to the body's own cells and tissues. And these abnormal antibodies are kind of coined as RF antibodies. They're found in the blood and they help in indicate with blood tests that this disease is present. Some classic signs that we see are ulnar deviations. And so remember your ulna is in your forearm. It's the one that runs to your pinky. And so we see that there's a deviation that happens and you can see that in the hands here. We see that a lot of times rheumatoid arthritis is gonna affect your fingers, wrists, elbows, feet, knees. They're the most frequent, but they can really affect any joint. Symptoms from rheumatoid arthritis are fever and malaise. So not only do you have the joint pain from the body attacking the joints, you also have that fever and then just the fact that you don't feel good. Now, prevention. Rheumatoid arthritis could be linked again to a rogue set uh, from after a strep infection. And so accurate diagnosis of, a, diagnosis of a strep infection is key too with some of this. Also see surgical joint replacement can be helpful in helping with that attack if that joint is starting to be affected greatly. One thing we see too when we look at some symptoms, when you see this disformity that's starting to happen here, this is what we would see with what we call alkalosis where the joints start to stiffen up or lock up um, due to this buildup that happens in the joint um, being destroyed by your own antibodies. We also see that there's what we call panis formation, and that's these little bumps that you see. Panis formation is a very big indication of rheumatoid arthritis versus other types of arthritis. You can also see there's a very big deviation that starts to happen in the fingers. So these are some really good pictures of showing you joints that are affected by rheumatoid arthritis or RA. So let's talk about treatments, okay? Some treatments when we look at this are anti-inflammatory medications might be helpful in helping the body not attack as much. Analgesics, so like painkillers are obviously helpful because these are gonna have some painful reactions based on those what joints are involved. We also see that we can see DMARDs, DMARDs. These are gonna be disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So these are specifically against those kind of RH antibodies, those drugs might be helpful. Uh, biological medications, these are ones that act on the immune system itself. So maybe trying to help calm down the immune system. 
exercise and a rest routine is really important in the sense of exercising to where you're staying active, but also resting a proper amount of time. And then also in the short term, we don't want to use corticosteroids for long term treatment because that actually can affect the immune system in a more negative way. But for short term treatments, corticosteroids could be utilized. All right. So this is what we're seeing with rheumatoid arthritis. Another type of autoimmune disorder is masthenia gravis. This type of issue is very slow on its onset. You don't see the symptoms very quickly. What's happening here when we talk about masthenia gravis is that the immune system is actually attacking the acetylcholine. So it's attacking the acetylcholine, which is what's released from your nerves and talks to your muscle cells. And it's also going to be taking the place of that acetylcholine on your receptors. So the acetylcholine can't do what it needs to do in telling your muscles to actually function, to contract. And so a lot of this is going to cause a type of paralysis to almost happen because those muscles cannot respond even when the signal from the nerve occurs. So we do see some common symptoms that come with this are diplopia. This is double vision. We also see then ptosis. Ptosis is a drooping of the eyelids that occurs. We then have dysphagia. This this is difficulty swallowing. Dysphonia is difficulty talking. We also see that they start to have difficulty potentially with facial expressions. Okay, again, the muscles not responding. And then also fatigue. The issue with Mesenia gravis is that it's there's periods of remissions where the patient feels really good, the antibodies are not attaching, and so we see the acetylcholines working like it's supposed to, and then exacerbations when it's really bad, all right? And so it's kind of has this come and go type of thing to it. Now, treatment a lot of times are what we would call cholerogenic medications. Cholerogenic medications are to decrease the breakdown of acetylcholine, thus allows acetylcholine to stay in the system a little bit longer, hopefully being able to have some effects on the muscles. Also, plasma exchange. Plasma exchange removes the antibodies that are affecting the receptors and removes them and then gives the plasma back. And so this allows us to remove those antibodies who are the culprit and the problem. Now, this doesn't really fix the issue, but it does help with some treatment. One thing is, is a lot of times this can be triggered by simple things like a, a flu shot or a certain type of infection that you were given. It's not something that we can really detect that's going to occur and happen, but it's kind of a, in rare cases can happen due to that. Okay. And so a lot of these autoimmune disorders are linked to when our immune system was doing something it was supposed to do. And then all of a sudden it goes rogue and it starts doing what it shouldn't. All right, so let's talk about diabetes type 1. Type 1 diabetes mellitus is believed to be caused by an autoimmune disorder. A lot of times they feel like it could have been triggered by a viral infection like rubella, mumps, influenza, and this could have even been triggered while the baby was in utero because type 1 diabetes is normally diagnosed very early. We call this juvenile diabetes. Now, there are other types of diabetes mellitus that are not autoimmune caused. When we talk about type 2, it's not an autoimmune disorder. Now, all types of diabetes mellitus do affect the endocrine system as well. And we're going to talk about them more when we get to the actual endocrine system. But we do want to see that this particular type, type 1, does have an autoimmune basis where the immune system actually alters the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. And so it hurts them. It hinders those beta cells and those beta cells are no longer able to produce insulin like they're supposed to triggering this type of diabetes. Another autoimmune disorder that we want to look at that's located here is lupus. This is lupus erythromatosis. This type of lupus could be put into two groups, cutaneous. With the cutaneous, this is going to be where we see it more on the skin. It's limited in its kind of area that it's affecting. We do see, though, that the systemic side is very widespread. It affects multiple systems, okay? So we can see that it's more self-contained if it's the cutaneous. It's more widespread if it's the systemic. So let's talk more about the systemic lupus. Okay, this is also known as SLE 
or lupus for short a lot of times. This is a chronic disease that has remissions and exacerbations. Like we talked about earlier, there's going to be times that the patient feels really good and there's going to be times that they feel really bad. Now, the problem with lupus, guys, is this particular disease is known as the great imitator. A lot of times, depending on which organs are involved, which systems are being affected by the antibodies from lupus, it's going to draw us to think there's an issue with that particular organ or that particular system, when in reality, it's the immune system attacking those systems. And so we see that it's a lot of times delayed diagnosis when we talk about lupus. Now, some of the very characteristic signs that we see with lupus are a butterfly rash across the face. So you see it right through here, a butterfly type rash. We also see that they'll have joint pain, fever and weight loss that occurs. Now, when we're talking about this systemic type, well, a lot of times what we're going to have to do treatment wise is treat the symptoms, whatever symptoms they're having, whichever organs are being affected. That's the type of treatment we're going to have to give somebody with lupus. So we see sometimes we would use non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs might be utilized antipyretics to help with fever, analgesics to help with pain and corticosteroids. Again, corticosteroid use has to be limited because we don't want to trigger other issues with the immune system. Okay, so really when we look at this, guys, there's no cure for lupus. We do not have a cure for that. What we're doing is we're just helping the patient deal with their symptoms that they're dealing, that they deal with. So we're just helping the patient deal with the symptoms that they have. The next one we see is scleroderma. This is a hardening, thickening, and shrinking of your connective tissue. This includes the connective tissue found in the skin. Again, we see that there are periods of remissions and exacerbations with this. Again, it's an autoimmune issue, and we see that it causes joint contractures. Um, Renard's phenomenon, which you can see under here, Renard's phenomenon is where you see the paleness in the fingers, right? Where it's like circulation is decreased in those areas. We also see that thick, leathery, shiny, and taut or tight skin is, is a sign or symptom. We see treatment. There's no cure for scleroderma. The main thing we're going to use is antibiotics or immunosuppressants as well as anti-inflammatories to help, um, especially when we're talking about our skin being compromised, opportunistic infections can come in. It may be beneficial to perform muscle stretching and stretching exercises to help with that connective tissue. Because guys, if you'll think about it, connective tissue is not just found in your skin. Connective tissue is found in pretty much any organ. And so if this is happening anywhere in the body, it's going to have this kind of shrinkage, this kind of pulling that's occurring, and it can be very painful and it can then start to affect those specific organs. All right, so now let's talk about the hypersensitivity with blood transfusions. This is normally a type two type of hypersensitivity and blood transfusion reactions are when you're given the wrong blood. All right, and so this is why blood typing is such a big deal. We know a lot more about it now, and so it's a big deal to make sure we give the right blood to an individual. But guys, when we have a huge accident that comes in, we can't sit there and necessarily wait for their blood type results to come back before we give them blood. So what do we do? What blood do we give them? Well, type O blood, guys, is the universal blood donor. And if you are type O blood and you've donated blood before, you know this because they will call you every six to eight weeks and ask you to to give more blood because you are going to help build that bank. On the other hand, if you have type AB blood, you're the universal getter. You can have any kind of blood pretty much. You can have A, you can have B, you can have O, and you can have AB. Now, when we look at this, guys, this is one of those things that is what we call a codominance in genetics. If you have A blood, you are either AA or AO. If you have B blood, you're either BB or BO. If you have O blood, you just have the two little O's. And if you have AB blood, you have both the A antigen and B, okay, on your blood cells. So you can kind of look at it as like A blood is with red sprinkles, B blood is with blue sprinkles, and AB is with a mixture of red and blue. And that's where you get that kind of purple. Whereas O blood is just like the glazed donut, Okay, now if you have A blood, you automatically have an antibody against B. So if you're given B blood, it will attack it and destroy that B blood. If you have B blood and you're given A blood, it'll automatically destroy it because you have an antibody against A. So if you look at this little chart over here, you can see that A can donate to other A's and AB. 
B's can donate to B and AB. O can donate to A, B, AB, or O. And AB can only donate to AB, okay? Now, what are the symptoms when a blood transfusion goes wrong, okay, when you're given the wrong blood? Well, you're gonna see that the patient will start to get chills, they'll shiver, and they'll have fever. And this is because what's happening is their body is attacking the new red blood cells that came in. They obviously needed more blood because they're bleeding out or there's some sort of accident that's happening. But now what we see happening is these red blood cells are being torn apart. They're being broken. And now we have a bunch of debris also in the blood vessels. So now the patient's gonna be worse off than they were before. This could result in things called microclots to happen or embolises, and it could also cause a DIC. Now DIC we'll talk about in a later lecture. Another type two um, hypersensitivity is the erythroblastosis fatalis. This is where the mother's antibodies attack and destroy the baby's red blood cells. Okay, they have antibodies against the baby's red blood cells and this ultimately causes the baby to die because their red blood cells are being destroyed. Now this is what we talked about when I was talking about earlier about that passive immunity. This is what we see with RH positive babies who have RH negative mothers. So if the mother is RH negative, she will not create a positive antibody until her body has seen an RH positive blood cell. So the first baby that's RH positive is normally okay. It doesn't have to worry. But during the childbirthing process, we see that there's a mixture of blood that occurs. Some of the baby's blood gets mixed with the mom's. When this happens, the mom's body can notice that RH positive cell and it will then make antibodies and memory cells against it. So then when the mom has another RH positive pregnancy, the body will then destroy that baby, causing a miscarriage. Well, one way to prevent this is that we can use a Rogam shot. You can see that here. It prevents the development of RH antibodies. We see that it's given prophylactically. It's given a lot of times right before delivery and then right after delivery of that first baby. Okay, and so this allows us to be able to stop the mom from creating memory cells. Therefore, the next pregnancy is like her first when it comes to being an RH positive baby. One way to help save the baby's life in this case is treatment through blood transfusions for the child, for the baby until birth, but this is a big problem sometimes. The baby doesn't normally last that long. Now, condition only affects RH positive babies that are carried by RH negative mothers. If you're an RH positive mother, you do not have to worry about this. This is also known as the hemolytic disease of the newborn. All right, so let's talk a little bit about organ rejection. So organ rejection also falls into this kind of, could be type two, sometimes type four, depending on how quickly the rejection takes place. But we see that the human immune system starts to attack the transplanted tissue. We've got to make sure that we get the closest match as possible. What we want to do is we want to kind of almost trick the immune system. Have you ever looked at somebody who had like a new hairdo or they just did something very subtle that was different and you noticed there was a difference but you couldn't put your finger on what the difference was? This is what we wanna to do to the immune system. We want the immune system to come by that, that new tissue, whether it's a new heart, a new kidney, a new whatever. And we want it to come by and be like, mm, something's different about that, but I can't put my finger on it. I'll have to come back and check it later. And so that way it doesn't actually attack it because it cannot decide whether it belongs or not. Okay, so acute rejection occurs almost right off the bat. You see it within a day or two where the body starts rejecting the organ or the tissue. Chronic rejection is a long process. This is going to be one that takes a long time and this is where they actually see a buildup of complexes of antibodies and antigens building up within the organ and it causes the organ to be epoxic and lose a blood supply and it ultimately will kill the new organ. So this is why it's so important that we make a match. Now, the normally what we think about with organ rejection is host versus graft. It's where my body is going to attack the new tissue or organ that was given to me. That's the normal thing we think of of organ rejection. But we see that there's also graft versus host. This is only seen, however, in individuals who have had bone marrow transplants. With bone marrow transplants, the bone marrow is new stem cells, which are new red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. 
those new white blood cells could then start to attacking you because they didn't belong to you to begin with. They were transplanted into you. That is called the graft versus host rejection. And again, we only see it with bone marrow. Now there's different types of transplants. Okay, when we look at this, there's what we would consider allogenic. Those are ones who are a match. There's synergenic, which is an identical twin. Okay, if we were lucky enough to have an identical twin, there would not be that chance of rejection. We also see that you can have an auto type of transplant, like with tissues of your skin, where I take it from my thigh and it gets put on my arm. No rejection's gonna happen there. There's xenogenic, this is from another species. We do see this with valves in the heart. This can come from cows or pigs. We do see that there is a hyperacute type of rejection that can occur. This is gonna be immediate up to three days. Acute rejection is the most common and it happens anywhere from four days to three months after the transplant. And chronic is four, year, four months to years, okay, before we see the rejection take place. All right, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about immuno, immunodeficiency disorders. This is the inability of the immune system to protect itself against pretty much anything, right? Because the immune system is so degraded, it's so kind of broken down, it can't protect against disease. Now this could be congenital, kind of a genetic disorder, and we see that with SCID, which we'll talk about in a minute, or it could be acquired, and that's the more common type with what we would call AIDS. So let's talk about the acquired type first. Acquired types may be due to bone marrow suppression. This could be due to like chemotherapy or radiation. And so due to the treatments you had to have against the cancer, it's caused you to have an acquired immunodeficiency. Um, certain medications can also be given. These are normally what we call anti-rejection medications. And this is to try to help weaken your immune system enough to where it will not reject the organ you were just given, uh, but it does make you more susceptible to disease. And then we call just plain immunodeficiency. This is like acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is what AIDS stands for. So guys, AIDS is caused by a virus. It's caused by a human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. This virus is a very unique virus because it is an RNA virus that has to go backwards. So it's like a retrovirus and it has to make the DNA and then go forward again. It has the ability to gain access into your helper T cells. This causes it to eradicate, eradicate your lymphocytes. Your helper T cells are the connection between the two sides of your immune system. And if we can take that connection out, it weakens both sides of your immune system. The virus must enter your body and then get into your bloodstream. The virus is very fragile and easily killed. However, we do find that it can be transmitted through like blood transfusions. It also could be transmitted most of the time through sexual interactions. Now guys, when we look at this, the AIDS issue that we have worldwide is still considered a pandemic. That is a big issue. We do not have a lot of treatments or cure. We don't even have a cure for AIDS and it's still killing lots of people every year. So AIDS transmission of HIV. Um, there's many misconceptions when it comes to this idea of transmission of how you can get HIV. A person cannot get HIV from toilet seats because remember we just said it's very fragile and so even if it was to get on that it would it would break down very easily. Um, doorknobs, can't get it from that. Furniture, water fountains, even just kissing. Uh, coughing and sneezing, sharing utensils. It is not airborne, foodborne, urine, feces, or water, okay? We can't get them from those things, all right? When we talk about transmission, transmission is going to be from direct bodily fluid contact, okay? And this is gonna be mostly very very specific, specifically blood or sexual contact. Now, when we look at this, AIDS is primarily spread in three ways. Sexual intercourse, sharing of hypodermic needles because we're directly going into the bloodstream, and in utero when a, an affected mother is going to infect the unborn baby. It can cross the placenta. This means the child is born directly with the HIV virus. Now, HIV does have stages. In the early stages of HIV, you don't even really realize you have it. It's what we would consider an asymptomatic stage, okay? It's a lot of times undetectable with that before a year in the bloodstream. And so if you were exposed to HIV, you would have to do a test at 
um, normally like right away, three months, six months, nine months at a year. At a year, if you're still HIV negative, you're negative. Okay, now positive can happen at any of those points, but to get a full negative test, it has to be negative at a year. Now this latent early stage can actually last for a very long time, okay? Um, sometimes you'll have flu-like symptoms, but normally it's not a big deal. We do see that the clinical latency is where we do detect it. You have a positive test. So we've gotten to the point that you have a positive test, but you don't have really any other symptoms. Okay, again, we talk about it being asymptomatic. Now this can actually last for decades, we found. It can last for years and years and years. However, when your immune system gets so low to a certain point where you do not have enough immune cells, that's when it transitions into the third stage, which is AIDS. Age is, AIDS is when you're very sick and this is where your T cells cell number is less than 200. All right, so you're getting very, very low. When we look at late stage AIDS, T cell counts drops below 200 cells per microliter. Treatment is normally with what we call an ART type treatment. This is an antiretroviral treatment. So it's a combination of medications to help against the virus. And prevention is avoid the HIV virus. This is the only way to not get AIDS, okay, is to prevent the whole idea of being infected with HIV. Now there's a number of ways to do this. Um, now we check blood, okay? So we know what HIV is, we know what it looks like, so we check blood. So you're not gonna get this from a blood transfusion. Another thing is don't use dirty needles. Don't do things that share needles like that. Protect yourself. You, especially working in the medical field, you need to act like everybody has HIV. This is to help protect you. Okay, in that sense. And also taking the proper precautions sexually. Okay, and in reality, that's a lot harder because HIV being a virus, it can get through a condom. It can be passed in that way. And so abstinence is kind of the only foolproof kind of way. But again, knowing your partner, asking those questions are super important. Now guys, when we look at HIV, you can actually see that when we get two full-blown AIDS, you're gonna see multiple body systems starting to be affected. Um, you'll see in the central nervous system, they're gonna be more susceptible to complications like meningitis, encephalitis. They can even get a type of dementia due to their AIDS. You can see tumors develop in that lymphoma type of structure, like a, like a type of lymphoma cancer. We see the large intestines, you'll see more colitis take place. The blood vessels, you'll get see a type of cancer that's very common in age. It's called Kaposi sarcoma. The mouth, you'll start to see more of the herpes virus and even thrush. Thrush is normally a childhood disease, but you'll see it a lot of times in the immunosuppressed. The lungs, they tend to get a lot more pneumonia. They'll get AIDS um, nephropathy. This affects their kidneys. Malabsorption of their small intestines. On their skin, they get a lot of sores that starts to happen. And guys, the big thing with AIDS and HIV is it's not what actually kills you. They What they die from is specifically opportunistic infections. Infections that normally their body would be able to fight off, but they're not able to. And that's what the problem is when we talk about a lot of these immunodeficiencies. So a rare disease that we can see, which is also an immunodeficiency, is called Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Disease, or SCID. This is a group of inherited disorders that causes partial or complete dysfunction of the immune system. If you've ever heard about the boy in the bubble and the research that was done behind him back in like, the, I think it was in the 50s, um, you will see that that is what it's talking about with SCID. It's gonna be where the individual is born with a very limited or no immune system at all, and that is a genetic issue. Okay, it is very rare, but it can occur. Now, what happens to your immune system with aging? Well, there's two main things that we see happening as we age with our immune system. One, degenerated thymus gland. Your thymus gland begins to atrophy and slowly starts to get smaller after puberty. This is ultimately going to start affecting your T cells. Okay, the thymus gland, gland specifically is with those T lymphocytes. We also see changed function in your antibodies. This could be due to poor nutrition, 
um, lack of exercise, medications we take as we get older, or even what we would call a psychosocial influence that could happen due to like stress, anxiety, things like that. It could start to affect our antibodies and how they work. And so we see the aging process, the longer we live, the more effects it's going to have on our body when we talk about the antibodies and our immune system just starts to wear out. Now, if you have any questions, any concerns, please let me know. Again, remember, I am here to help you. 